which book of the Bible we looked at last sermon, last Sunday? Okay, well, that, that show of hands. So we didn't, we didn't follow instructions. Um, the, the teacher didn't follow instructions here. Uh -huh. So you'll have detention. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, do, we don't paddle anymore, right? That's illegal. So um, anyway, yes, uh, the book of Micah. The, the bonus question is, show of hands, who, who remembers what chapter? Anybody remember what chapter? Got, got, got a couple people. It was chapter... What chapter? Shout it out. Five. Chapter 5. And what verse? 3, 2. 3, 2, 1. <laughs> it was 2. Chapter 5 and verse 2. And so it was a verse that we often hear at Christmas. And I would bet that most, if not all of you, never heard any of the other stuff we looked at last week in the rest of the book. This week's another one of those verses. This is in Isaiah. And Isaiah starting in chapter 7. And here is a, I, I got out of the copy room there this morning. Here's a, you know, here's how the blank bulletins come in. You know, they're blank on one side and then have the stuff that you see on the front and the back. And, of course, they always have, you know, pictures and so forth. And this, was, this is one for the Christmas season. And there's the verse, Isaiah 7, 14. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Emmanuel. And so we, we see that on bulletins. We see that on, on uh, bulletin boards and so forth. Quoting Isaiah 7, 14. How many of you have ever studied through all the other stuff that is around that one single verse that we hear about. And I would suspect that many of you would be like me, who never heard anything about any of the other verses in all my years of going to church. Um, and so we're going to start at the beginning of chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to eventually, of course, get up to verse 14 that's going to be on the front of our one of our Christmas season bulletins here this year, uh, being quoted. But what, what was the context? Why was that verse used in Isaiah 7:14? And and we'll, we'll go with that once we once we get there. And so the first verse of chapter seven actually summarizes what was going on in, in at that time in, where Isaiah was at in the land of Israel and so forth. The first verse summarizes what was going on, and then the following verses described how it actually summarizes what happened after all this stuff was done in verse one, and then. Verses 2 and forward explains how that all happened. And so the first verse, there's a whole bunch of names, and you just got to hang in there with me. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramaliah, who was king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. And so what was going on, again, this is in the divided kingdom of Israel. The, the Israel had split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was also called, in the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom was called Israel. Israel. Sometimes that they were called Jacob. Some, sometimes, as in here, they were called Ephraim. And you just you have to, the only way you can understand who it's talking about is the context, and you have to know the different context that these names were used. But and and, and we're going to see that the capital of the northern kingdom was what? The capital of the northern kingdom of Israel was Samaria, and the southern kingdom was called what? Judah, Judah and also referred to in here as. As the house of David, and the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah was Jerusalem, and the king of Jerusalem, or the king of the southern kingdom, and he was stationed in Jerusalem at that time, his name was given here in the first verse. Anybody remember that? It starts with an A. Ahaz, and the, and the king of the northern kingdom was. Actually, Pika. Pika. I know there's all kinds of struggles. And so you're just going to have to really hang in there with me. And I'll try to explain who these are. Maybe you should just say so and so. Yeah, here's the deal. Here's the deal. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel, they had split. And the northern kingdom of Israel had teamed up with another nation. Aram was a nation. Aram was a nation to the north of the northern kingdom of Israel. And the king of the northern kingdom, who was Rezin, he 
allied with the king of the, of the northern kingdom, who was Pekah, whose name is only mentioned in verse 1, and after that he's only referred to as the son of Ramalia. That was a, that was a diss from God. Do, do, do we still say diss? Yes. Is that, okay. God was basically dissing him by only referring to him as being the son of Ramalia after the first verse. So every time you see the son of Ramalia, that's referring to the king of the northern kingdom. And so the king of the northern kingdom has allied with this other kingdom, Aram, and, and, and their king, and, and they are going to team up, and they are going to go against the southern kingdom of Israel. Yes, that's right. Northern kingdom of Israelites went to war against the southern kingdom of Israelites. That's how bad the split was in the divided kingdom of that time. And so, but what does verse 1 say was the result of that? What does, at the end of verse 1 there in chapter 7 that we looked at, what's it say the result was? They, they were not going to succeed. They did not succeed, right? And so how did that happen? Well, that's what we pick up in verse 2 about then. It says, now the, th this takes the story from the beginning un un until the end then. Verse 2 says, now the house of David was told, and the house of David again would refer to which kingdom? Yeah, the southern kingdom of Judah, and maybe even specifically referring to their king, Ahaz. The house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. That's that foreign country allied themselves with Ephraim, which is another name for the northern kingdom of Israel. And so therefore, the hearts of Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, and his people were shaken, it says, as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And then the Lord said to Isaiah, Isaiah was the prophet. The Lord said to Isaiah the prophet, go out, you and your son, Sheir Jeshub. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details. There's a bunch of names listed in this account that are symbolic and the names mean something. I'm not even going to get into Sheir Jeshub's meaning of his name. There's, there's, we, we won't get down to the food if I do all this stuff. But anyway, God told Isaiah, you take your son, Sheir Jeshub, and go out and meet Ahaz. Ahaz again was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. The one that was afraid. The one that the, the two northern countries were going to attack them. Go meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Wow, that's, that's specific, right? That's like saying, I'll, I'll, I'll meet Parker up at the trailhead at Tatesville. Right? I mean, very specific where God said to go meet King Ahaz. Verse 4 says, say to him. Isaiah was to say to who? King Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, who was, they, they were to understand that they were going to be attacked. The Lord said to him, say, say to, told Isaiah, say to Ahaz, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these, and here's one of my favorite terms in the Bible, because of these two, what? Smoldering stubs of firewood. I love that. I don't know why, but I just absolutely love that. Don't be afraid of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Don't be afraid because it says of the fierce anger of Rezin, who was the king of Aram, and who? R Ramalia's son, which again was Pekah, the, the king of the northern kingdom. Don't be afraid of these two. Verse 5 says, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son, these two northern kingdoms and their kings, have plotted your ruin, southern kingdom, saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king over it. The son of Tabeel was probably somebody from Aram, the country of Aram, which was like uh, Syrian. And so this, is, this was the plan. This was the game plan. We're going to go down. We're going to join our forces together. We're going to go down and attack Judah and defeat them and we're going to kick out Ahaz as king and we're going to put this guy from Syria in as king. Verse 7 says, Yet or but, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. The Sovereign Lord, that is Adonai Yahweh. This is what the two kingdoms were planning. This is what the two kings are planning to do to you. But this is what I say, God said. The Sovereign Lord, Adonai, Yahweh, says this is what I say. It will not take place. It what? It ain't going to happen. 
What they're planning to do is not going to happen. Verse 8, for the head of Aram is Damascus. Again, I didn't bring that up, but what do you think Damascus is in relation to Aram? Damascus is a town, a city. It was. It's the capital. Damascus was the capital of Aram. And the head of Damascus, the man who sits over the head as the head of Damascus, was the king, Rezin. And it says it is what? Only. What? Only Rezin. What he's saying is, I am Adonai Yahweh. This guy in Aram is just a man. This king in Aram, he's just a man. It's God versus a man. Who do you think is going to win? Boy, that was weak. Sorry, Lord. Apparently they're doubting you. If it's God against a man, who is going to win? God. Thank you. Please be a little more lively this morning. I know the food's cooking and smelling good, but you're going to have to hang in with me. And then it says in the second part of verse 8, Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. Ephraim, again, another name for the northern kingdom of Israel. God said within 65 years, they will be too shattered to even be a people. I, again, in interest of time, I won't get into to it too much, but the 65-year time frame refers to what, what ended up, what Assyria did. Assyria was the ones that were going to conquer them. And what Assyria did, they would conquer a nation, they would deport a bunch of their people, and then they would take other foreign people from other places and move them into the country. Why? To dilute the, the native peoples in that area so that they basically to wipe out their, their people. Like that there would no longer even be a majority of, of that people living. There wouldn't even be many of that people living in their homeland anymore. There would be foreign people from other parts of the world that they would move in. In 65 years after this, that's what Assyria did to the northern kingdom. They had, they had deported a number of Israelites over, over time, and they had brought in some foreigners. And then 65, this 65-year period ties in to when they brought a bunch more foreigners in, and you basically could not even recognize the northern kingdom of Israel anymore. The, the whole northern kingdom was all occupied by foreign, mostly foreign people. There would have been scattered Israelites left, but essentially that's what this is referring to. God saying, don't worry, Ahaz. Don't worry, southern kingdom of Judah. The, these ones that are going to come attack you, I got it. I'm going to take care of them. And in fact, both kingdoms are going to get wiped out. And the, southern, and the northern kingdom of Israel is actually going to even cease to be able to be recognized as a nation within 65 years. Verse 9 says, The head of Ephraim, the northern kingdom, is what? Samaria. Which was what? The capital. the capital of the northern kingdom. And then the head of Samaria, the, the king who sits in Samaria, is what? Only Ramalia's son. Only Pekah. Just a man. Once again, it's God versus man. And who's going to win? God. Who's going to win every time? God. Adonai Yahweh. The sovereign Lord. Last part of verse 9 says, If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, this was all directed to Ahaz. God told Isaiah, the prophet, to tell Ahaz this stuff. And the final thing he told him was, if you don't stand firm in your faith, you're not going to stand at all. He's saying to, to the king of the southern kingdom, buck up. I got this. You need to have faith in me. I don't care what those two smoldering stubs of firewood are saying. Verse 10. Again, the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to Ahaz through Isaiah. And verse 11 says, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. And so essentially what God was saying through Isaiah was, You, you King Ahaz, you ask me for some kind of miraculous sign. Whatever you ask me, I will do it to prove to you what I'm going to do. That I'm going to protect the southern kingdom of Israel from these two northern kingdoms from overcoming them, from conquering them. So, essentially God's saying, tell me, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it as a sign, as proof, as evidence to you, that I'm not going to let these two northern kingdoms harm the southern kingdom. What was Ahaz's response? Verse 11, or verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, 
Who, who told him to ask? God. God did, through Isaiah. But God told him, ask me what you want so I can give you this sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. What did he say? I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, most commentators, most Bible scholars think that's, that was like a pious way of saying I don't have faith. <laughs> and what we might compare it to is people that I have heard through the years say, well, I can't, I can't do ministry, or I, I can't do this or that. I'm not worthy of doing it. You know, That sounds really pious. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not worthy enough to, to do that. But it's just a good excuse. It sounds pious, but it's an excuse. And that is exactly what Ahaz was doing. That's why God had told him, if you don't stand firm in your faith, you're not going to stand at all. And he told him, you ask me for whatever sign you want to prove this, and I'll give it to you. And Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask for that. I, I, I wouldn't do that. I, 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 I'm not worthy of doing that. I'm not going to test the Lord. Test the Lord. The Lord's the one who told you to give, to ask Him what sign you wanted. Well, the Lord wasn't overly pleased with that. And through Isaiah, verse 13, it says, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? And then here we go, verse 14, our Christmas verse. It's going to be on the front of the bulletin, right? All this is leading up to this. Now track with me. This is where you got to, if I've lost you, come back, please. This is the Christmas verse, Isaiah 7, 14. You, we've gone through 13 verses of Isaiah 7, right? Does it sound very Christmassy yet? Huh? No, it doesn't, does it? But verse 14 is continuing in the context of what we've looked at so far. Please keep that in mind. Let's read verse 14. Should sound familiar. It's the one verse in Isaiah 7 you've probably ever heard before today. Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Who's you? Ahaz. Ahaz. Who God said, tell me what sign you want and I'll give it. And Ahaz gives me... Oh, no, I'm, I'm not worried. Oh, I can't do it. God says, fine. I'll give you a sign. So it's about... A sign about what? If he's given Ahaz the sign, the sign is to demonstrate that God's going to what? He's going to save the kingdom of Judah. Right? What, what, what do we have it on our Christmas bulletin for then? What's that have to do with this? Well, stay tuned. I, I love the puzzled looks I see. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned. But understand, this is original context that we're looking at. And the original context is, fine, Ahaz, you're wussing around. I mean, you don't, you're not, I told you to ask me for a sign. You won't. I'm going to tell you what the sign will be. And what will the sign be? What does verse 14 say? What's the sign that God's going to do to prove that He's going to save the southern kingdom? A virgin will, will be with child and will give birth to a son and we'll call him Emmanuel. Now the first thing you need to understand is in Hebrew, the Hebrew word translated virgin here is Alma. Or Alma, I'm not sure which syllable gets the emphasis. That word, and this, and this, please listen closely now. This is the thing that would get me in the most trouble is if you go out of here and tell me that I'm denying the virgin birth of Jesus. Tell people that I'm denying the virgin birth of Jesus. I'm not doing that. But what I'm telling you is this sign here, this birth of this child was not going to be a virgin birth. This very likely should be translated a young woman. Alma could be translated a young woman or a young woman of marriageable age, or something along those lines. And just keep hanging in there with me. But the original context, there, there's going to be a child that's born in the day of Isaiah that was going to be a sign that God was going to save the southern kingdom. That was going to be the sign that God gave. And so this child that was going to be born was not born... Supernaturally, like Jesus ended up being born, it would be born under normal human ways. And, but it was going to be a sign. This child, the birth of this child would be a sign. That's the context. Verse, verse 15. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. Who will? This, this child that would be born. 
would eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. It's talking about a young child getting old enough to be able to eat solid food and not be nursing off of his mother, but, but eating solid food. Curds is just like cottage cheese, and, and essentially that's what it is. I like cottage cheese. That's another sign I'm old, right? Only old people like cottage cheese, right? Huh? Well, you're old too. Well, not as old as me. <laughs> that was the right thing to say. Anyway, now let's get back on track. So this child would be old enough, you know, when a child gets old enough to start eating solid food, curds and honey and stuff like that, instead of just nursing off of its mother, when, he, said, he said he'll eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject wrong and choose the right. He'll be talking about when, a, when a, you know, a child starts to be able to reason things and so forth. An infant, all it knows is, get, give me the bottle, wah! You know, it doesn't reason, it can't figure anything out, stuff like that. that that's, that's where this is going. Verse 16, But before that boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will what? The sign was that this child that would be born, before that child was old enough to be able to discern what was right or wrong, these two kingdoms to the north, that Ahaz and the people of the southern kingdom were all up in, up in arms and their knickers in a twist over because they were going to attack them. God's saying, but before that kid is old enough, this kid that's going to be born, before he's even old enough to figure out right and wrong, those two kingdoms are going to be wiped out. That's what the sign of the kid, this child that would be born, was about. It was all about this context that we read about up to verse 14 and these two smoldering stubs of firewood and this attack that was coming on the southern kingdom and God saying, I'm going to take care of it, don't worry about it. Tell me what you want for a sign to prove to you that I'm going to not allow this to happen. And then when, that would, when Ahaz wouldn't give him you know, a sign to give him, then God said, then this will be the sign. That's what all the context is so far. Now, verse 18. No, verse 17, right? Yes, verse 17. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Now, verse verse. 17 here is talking about the Lord will bring on you. Again, who was he talking to? Ahaz. So he's going to, we're going to get into it here more. He, he, God was used Assyria to conquer the, those two northern kingdoms and not allow, that's who God was going to use to prevent those two northern kingdoms from attacking the southern kingdom. But now God's saying, also because of your unfaithfulness, uh, Ahaz, because of the unfaithfulness of the southern kingdom, that, that king is also going to end up punishing you. But, he, but God was going to limit it because God said later on He wasn't going to allow the Assyrians to completely conquer Jerusalem. There would be another nation 140 years later who would do that, which would be who? Babylon. And so the Lord says, I'm going to bring on you and your people, on the house of your father, a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. Uh, nothing like this that had happened since the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel separated. He was going to bring the king of Assyria upon them. The same weapon that the God was going to use to punish the northern kingdom, God was also going to use to punish the southern kingdom for their unfaithfulness and their sinfulness. Verse 18 says, In that day the Lord will whistle for flies from the distant streams of Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. What's that symbolic language talking about? What, what would the flies from Egypt be? Actually, it would be troops. It's, it's poetic language for there would be troops from Egypt who would come up and harass and cause problems for the southern kingdom in the future. This is all prophecies that was going to apply not only to Judah under Ahaz, but under future kings of Judah as well because of the disobedience, the continued disobedience of Judah, the southern kingdom. God was going to use Egyptian troops, armies were going to come up and God wasn't going to protect them against them. And then God was also going to use what? What's it say in verse 18? Bees from the land of Assyria. What, you ought to be able to get this one now. What's that? Troops from Assyria. And even 
Harsher troops, right? Would you rather deal with a fly or a bee? Fly. Hopefully a fly. Bees are a lot more fearsome than a fly is. And so Assyria was going to be a whole lot, as much problems as Egypt, Egypt's armies would cause for Judah, Assyria would cause more. This was a prophecy of what, what was going to be happening, actually, like I said, over the next 140 years. Verse 19, they will all come and settle in steep ravines and in the crevices in the rocks and all the thorn bushes and all the water holes. And, and in that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the river, the king of Assyria, to shave your head and the hair of your legs and to take off your beards also. What in the heck is that all about? It's more poetic language. Let, let me start at the beginning of that verse again. Verse 20, And that day the Lord will use a razor, that's poetic language for a, a powerful ruler, hired from beyond the river. Do you know what river? Look at your footnote in your Bible. The Euphrates. Who was beyond the Euphrates River? Assyria. The king of Assyria. And what's this deal about shaving their heads and their legs and their beards? It was a form of disgrace that literally conquering troops would often shave uh, con the, the troops that they conquered. And I'm to understand actually even shave private areas and make them march around naked to shame them. This was one of the things that they did. And that's what all that's referring to. Verse 21, In that day a man will keep alive a young cow and two goats, and because of the abundance of the milk they give, he'll, he will have curds to eat. All who remain in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, in every place where there were a thousand vines, worth a thousand shekels, silver shekels, there will be only briars and thorns. Men will go there with bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. And as for all the hills, once cultivated by the hoe, you will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where, she where sheep run. Again, Ahaz and future kings of Judah. This is a... Is, is a pronouncement of judgment by God. Basically, a lot of times, all they would have to eat would be curds and honey. Because land that was once fertile and farmed and productive and so forth was going to be decimated. And what, what was, how was it going to be decimated? Because this conquering army was going to come in and decimate them. And decimate the land. And this was a coming prediction of a coming judgment in the midst of the prediction of the salvation of the southern kingdom of Judah from Aram and the northern kingdom of Israel. In the midst of that, God's saying, especially because Ahab, Ahaz was not showing any faith here, He's saying, but I'm telling you, in the, I'm going to save you right now, but guess what? You're going to get yours. You're going to get your comeuppance too. And so is your nation, the southern kingdom, the nation of your father for generations to come because of un unfaithfulness and disobedience. That's what that's all about. Now if you get back, chapter 8 goes, goes back to the, the issue at hand right then and this sign that God was going to save Judah from the northern kingdom of Israel and from their partnered nation, Aram, the nation of Aram. The Lord said to me, chapter 8, verse 1, Take a large scroll and write, it, write on it with an ordinary pen. Everybody say it together. Meher, Shalal, Hashbaz. Oh, that's the chapter. <laughs> what, what, why was he to write that? What was that name going to be? The baby. Verse 2 says, And I will call in Uriah the priest and Zechariah son of Jeberachiah as a reliable witness for me, witnesses for me. And then I went to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him what? That funky name, this child that was to be born as a sign that God was not going to allow those two northern kingdoms to conquer Judah, that child who would be born and was born was named Meher Shalal Hashbaz. And what's verse 4 say? Before the boy knows how to say, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus, which was the capital of Aram, the northern country of Aram that had allied with who? The northern kingdom of Israel. Ephraim referred to here in this account, referred to as often as Ephraim. 
and the plunder of Samaria, which was the capital of Ephraim, or the northern kingdom, the wealth of both of those capital cities, of those two, two northern na nations who were threatening Judah, would be carried off by who? Assyria. By the king of Assyria, it says. So again, this Meher Shalal Hashbaz, this child who was to be a sign from God, before this child could even say, Mommy or Daddy, before it was old enough to be able to say those words, the capitals of those two northern kingdoms that were threatening Judah would be decimated and their wealth carried off by the Assyrian army. God, understand, this is what God had said would happen. And this child was born, and before the actual decimation of those two northern kingdoms, God said, that's going to happen now. After this child was born, that's going to happen before that child, before this boy, can even say, Mommy or Daddy. You think it happened? You can dang well bet you it did. Then verse 5 says, The Lord spoke to me again. Who? Isaiah. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over Rezin and the son of Ramalia, therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty flood waters of the river. What river? The Euphrates. The, Euphrates, the king of Assyria, with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over its banks. It's all poetic language. And it will sweep on into Judah. Sweep on into Judah from where? Think about it. What did we just read in the section before this? Once Assyria overran the northern kingdom of Israel, it was going to sweep on down into Judah. That's what's being described now. Passing through it and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings, that's the outspread wings, poetic description of the Assyrian army. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land, O oh. Emmanuel. And so again, this child was being referred to as Emmanuel, who, if you go back again to verse 14, remember, therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and we'll call Him Emmanuel, which means, of course, God with us, or God is with us. And so now, here, God is describing to Isaiah, He's saying, the northern kingdom is going to be taken care of the way I said it was, but what's also going to happen is what I said earlier was going to happen because of the unfaithfulness of Judah. His army, the Assyrian army, is going to sweep on down into Judah as well. And it's going to spread out throughout the nation of Judah and rise up to your neck, O Emmanuel. Using this child to... Again, say, this child who was called God is with us. And so, it sounded like, wait a minute, it sounded like gloom now and destruction for the southern kingdom as well, right? But what do the next verses say? Verse 9, Raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant lands, prepare for battle and be shattered. You, be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, go ahead, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand for what? God is with us, which is what, what, what means? Emmanuel. And so God's saying the armies of Assyria would overspread Judah, they would do a bunch of damage and so forth, but God would stop them short because God was going to be with them. Because he promised elsewhere that Assyria would not be able to destroy Judah. Later on, he would use Babylon. And we looked at that actually last week in Micah, who was actually a contemporary prophet with Isaiah, by the way. And remember in Micah last week, Micah predicted that Babylon would overcome Judah. And some 140 years later, they did in 586 B.C. But this is, this is back before that. The northern kingdom was going to be destroyed. The armies of Assyria would sweep on down into the southern kingdom. They would wreck a lot of havoc, but God would deliver them. Anybody remember how God delivered? Because it's not in this passage. It's elsewhere in the Old Testament. You know how God delivered the southern kingdom from the Assyrian army? Angel. Yeah, who, who was the Assyrian king? Sennacherib was their king. And outside of Jerusalem, the angel of death slayed 185,000 Assyrian troops in one night. 
And they turned tail and ran. And the prophecy was also given that Sennacherib would be killed when he got back home and then two of his own sons killed him when he got back home. And that was judgment on Assyria for what they were doing. And so God's laying this all out that again... This, this deliverance of Judah. God was going to first provide it for Judah from attack by the two northern kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and Aram. He was going to save them from that. The birth of the child was a sign of that. But then that he was also going to eventually, even though he was going to allow Judah to be punished a little bit, Judah would be saved again from Assyria. And Emmanuel, this child, God with us, that sign that God was going to, in this time, save Judah. And He did. Now you're probably still wondering about a lot of things here, but, and i got to close, so we're going to have to move here. Let me run through these next verses quickly here. Verse 11. The Lord spoke to me, spoke, spoke to who? Isaiah. Isaiah, with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. He said, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. Don't dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. Again, Adonai Yahweh. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And He will be a sanctuary, but for both houses of Israel, what, northern and southern kingdoms, He will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Any of you remember that from anywhere in the New Testament? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. Peter quotes that relative to who would be the stone that would make people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Jesus. Jesus. Here it's referred to Lord God. Peter quoted that verse and said Jesus would be the one who would cause people to stumble and fall. and The stone that would cause them to stumble and a rock that would make them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, He will be a trap and a snare. Verse 15, many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. It's talking about all this coming judgment on all the people of Israel at this time in Isaiah's day. That's what's still in view here. All right? And we're going to get there. We're going to get Christmassy. But, hang, but, but you got to understand all the context up so far ain't very Christmassy, right? But, but there was something going on in Isaiah's day that this was all initially about. Verse 16, Bind up the testimony, seal up the law among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding His face from the house of judgment, from the house of Jacob, which means judgment, that God hides His face from somebody. He's bringing judgment on them. And Isaiah said, I will put my trust in Him. Here I am, that's Isaiah, and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. When men tell you to consult mediums and spirits, spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God instead? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Verse 20 says, To the law and the testimony. What was he talking about? The Word of God, the Old Testament. At that time, to the law and the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, the word of God, the Old Testament, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam throughout the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king. And curse who? Their God. Their God. This is talking about the Israelites. Verse 22, Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust at, into out, utter darkness. And some of you again are saying, Oh, Jesus, He's on judgment again! But it's Christmas! Deck the halls, right? It's Isaiah 7.14. It has to be Christmassy, right? Well, it's finally going to turn Christmassy. But understand the context that it will be in. Chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be, this would be, there eventually will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. All this doom and gloom that was just described, all this judgment that would come on the Israelite people for disobedience and sin and unfaithfulness and so forth, and all this darkness and gloom that was described, it says, nevertheless, there will eventually be no more gloom for those who were in distress, the people of Israel. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. They were both tribes of Israel up around Galilee. But in the future He will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. How do you think Galilee would one day become honored? I heard a couple whispers. 
How would the, the region of Galilee, Galilee one day be honored? How, how, how did Jesus honor Galilee? He, he, well, he wasn't born there. He was born in Bethlehem, but he, he was raised there eventually. Once they traveled back from Bethlehem after he was a couple years old, probably, and, and they went back up around Nazareth in Galilee, that's where Jesus was raised. What, where, what's, what's turning here? What's, it, it, we're talking about all the gloom, doom and gloom back then and what was coming in the future, but, but now what, where's chapter 9 going? Some future day, though. Some future day, these people of Israel aren't going to have all this doom and gloom and judgment and destruction and so forth. And it's, it's starting to talk about this. this there's going to be this honor of Galilee by the way of the sea along the Jordan. That's a, that was a major thoroughfare, thoroughfare uh, along the Jordan River from Galilee down into Judah. And then verse 2 might sound familiar with, to a couple of you. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That's something else that's often read at Christmas time. This is talking about this future time when the light will come into the darkness for the, for the people of Israel. This future time. Verse 3, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. By the way, Midian's defeat was um, whenever... Uh, Gideon and his small band of God enabled Gideon and his small little army there to defeat the whole ar army, big army of Midian. And, and so this is described in times when God has, has done the conquering for Israel and, and everything. And it comes up to verse 6 and then surely you've heard this one. This was in another one. It's probably on one of our bulletins coming up here. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called what? Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign where? On David's throne and over his kingdom, David's kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time, when this starts to happen, from that time on and forever. And, and how will it happen? What's the last sentence say? The zeal of the Lord Almighty will make this happen. This, all this turns now from the darkness and gloom and it turns to this future time. All this darkness and punishment and judgment on Israel, gloom and all this stuff, someday it's going to turn. And of course, who's, who's in the picture here for the, that the child is to be born? Don't give me the proper name because they didn't know that yet. Messiah. Messiah. This is a prediction of the coming Messiah King of Israel. And that one day that Messiah King would come and He would reign on the throne of David in the kingdom of David. Has that happened yet? Was the son born? Yes. But he hasn't reigned yet, has he? No. Is he going to reign one day? Yes. Please say yes, yeah. Of course, many say no. Once again, many, many in churches in this area say no, no, there's not going to be a literal kingdom anymore. This, the, this verse that we, these verses we always read at Christmas time, that's exactly what it's pointing up to. And this was all so... We still not got... We didn't get churchy yet, did we? And I'm out of time and we didn't even get churchy yet. But this is all about Israel. And that there will be a time where this child would be born. What child is this talking about? Is this talking about Meher Shalal Hashbaz? No. Talking about Messiah. <laughs> this is talking about... Another child that will be born. But how, then how does, how does Isaiah 7.14 then, that if that was a prophecy about Meher Shalal Hashbaz, and how he would be a sign for the salvation of Judah and so forth, well then, well what, why, do we have, why, why do we have that on here then for Christmas time? Huh? It was a picture? What's a fancier word? Huh? I can't remember. A type. Good job. It was a type. It was a yeah. There was a child born then, and he was a sign that Judah would be saved and so forth. But but, but why is why why did is it quoted in Matthew chapter one at the birth of Christ? Why it says this this all happened to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said: for the virgin shall conceive a child, bear a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. 
because there was actually a child born initially in Isaiah's day that was a sign of salvation to Judah. But there was an even greater sign that would happen one day that happened when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of Micah 5.2 that we looked at last week. And, and that, that child would be a sign of also of salvation to His people, Israel. But has, has the salvation, did, the, did the salvation of Judah happen at the time God said it would happen with Meher Shalal Hashbaz? Yes. yes. Has the salvation of Israel, that this child, the one that the people walking in darkness and all this stuff we looked at at nine, for to us a child is born, that child's been born, we all acknowledge that, but has the salvation come to His people yet? No. How, how has salvation started to come to His people? Us. Through spiritual, through, through salvation of souls. In fact, the salvation that, that this child brings is not just, it is the salvation of the kingdom of Israel. Because it says right here, right, we just read, He will reign on David's throne and over David's kingdom, right? One day He will do that. It is about that, but it's about so much more. Jesus is also, the Christ child is the sign of salvation that's available to all who would come. Not just the southern kingdom of Judah, not just all of Israel, actually anybody who would come in saving faith and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They can be saved. This child is a sign of salvation as well. And so, it's okay that we put Isaiah 7.14 on the fronts of our bulletins. That's okay. But now you know the rest of the story. That there was actually a child born long ago who was the original sign that God gave to the people of the southern kingdom of Israel. But he was a type or a picture of another child who would be born that is spoken of then in chapter 9, Jesus was pictured in Meher Hashalal Hashbaz in Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. But in chapter 9, it's all Messiah. It's all a picture of the child that hadn't been born yet. And the deliverance that He will bring ultimately won't be completed until He comes back to the earth again when He will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and He will reign on the throne of David as King over Israel in the kingdom of David. <laughs> so what do you think? Amen. That, folks, again, I'm telling you, I have met very... I, I'm not sure if... Right now I can't think of a person I ever met that has heard that like before I told them about it and I'm not making that up that I'm obviously a lot of people know about it but I've not met anybody that I can think of uh, nobody I didn't know anything about this nobody knows about all this stuff we just went through all that context I never even got to the churchy part till clear at the end <laughs> And the, and the but churchy. I mean, it, it was all Israel. All the context was Israel until I tied in how, obviously, since Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, and Jesus is the one that fits this, then obviously then the New Testament says Jesus is not only the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of Israel, but He's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of all who would come. And so... Yeah, I, I mean, that's where the church comes into play. That's where we come into play. But you see all the... Uh, everything else, practically everything in Isaiah 7 through 9 is all about Israel. And how one day this Messiah will reign over Israel. It's not tied in to us until you get to the New Testament when Jesus was born and when the New Testament then revelation from God was that this Messiah, Jesus, would not only save Israel, but He would save all who would come to Him in faith, not physically, but spiritually, eternally. That's how then it ends up tying in. But don't throw out everything that applies to Israel here. And still applies to Israel. Which is what, frankly, the majority of people do.
There's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff in here again. Uh, obviously, as I'm usually I'm, I'm out of time. Um, there's a there's a lot of things in here that uh, application type things. Uh, if if nothing else, I leave this with you. What what was Ahaz's? What did what did God find fault with Ahaz? What what was it that he found fault with Ahaz about? doubted, he didn't have faith, so forth. That's what, he had just told him, if you don't stand in faith, you're not going to stand at all. Right? He said, tell me, tell me what sign you want. And he has him hauled. And obviously, actually, do you know the rest of the story of that is too? Later on, Ahaz actually went and tried to snuggle up to the king of Assyria and get his favor to protect them against the two northern kingdoms. That's, that's actually the rest of the story, and I'm glad I just now remembered it. Ahaz did not trust in God here so badly that he actually went and got into cahoots with the king of Assyria to protect him, instead of trusting that God would. In any case, if, if you think that that is, you know, you, you, we got to understand, if that's not a sign, if that's not a picture for us, well, how, do, how does God tell us anything? Bible. When He tells us something in here, you think we better stand in faith on it? Yeah. And trust in it? You think we shouldn't go out and try to, well, I gotta, I, I'm going to have to try to take care of this myself. We, we might not say it in so many words, but that's what we do a lot of times. When we don't believe what God says... And we try to handle stuff our way. Well, I gotta do what I gotta do, right? Can't tell you how many times I've heard that from people. I know the Bible says I shouldn't do that, but uh, you know, I gotta make my decisions, I gotta take care of myself, and okay. I hear that a lot. I've heard that a lot. Anyway, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Yes, the same one that was referred to in a virgin shall conceive and bear a son in Isaiah 7, but only, only as a picture of that. After that all happened, but Isaiah chapter 9, this son who was to be born, it's all about the Messiah. That's all about Jesus. And He's Jesus for us too. He is our sign of salvation. I pray that you all, every one of you, is safe in salvation through faith in Jesus. We're going to sing in closing, Away in a Manger, 262, because a child was indeed born. 262, Away in a Manger, please stand as we sing.